Good morning. And welcome to worship at Meadowbrook Congregational Church this second Sunday after Epiphany and Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Day weekend. I'm Pastor Joel Boyd, and I'm blessed to serve this church and all of its members and friends. I'd like to extend a special welcome to any visitors joining us today in person or joining us online. We're glad to have you with us. I'd like to invite everyone, if they haven't already had a chance to do so, to mark your calendars for next Sunday, January 22nd, when the Stewardship Ministry team will be holding its second special intergenerational program during fellowship hour. So that's really a very fancy way to say all ages, intergenerational, where, where all of us will be together talking about what it means for us to be giving as a church, giving of our time, giving perhaps of uh, our money, giving of our talents, uh, which could be all kinds of things that we know how to do. So join us for that after service next Sunday. And some of you may, may already know this, but for, for a few of us, it may be news that Michigan PF will be holding its upcoming retreat here uh, at Meadowbrook on Saturday, January 28th, uh, from 9 a.m. until 5 p.m. Uh, the retreat was originally planned for another location, but it will be here uh, at Meadowbrook Congregational Church. The retreat is free, and it is open to all middle and high school youth. Uh, we do ask that uh, kids still get registered, and you can take a look at the weekly messenger uh, to do that, or you could contact Sharon Brown or the office for more info. And friends, a Meadowbrook Congregational Church's annual meeting will be held following worship on Sunday, January 29th in the Fellowship Hall. Now, for anyone who would need to be submitting a report, an annual report for either your committee, your board, uh, and, you, and if you haven't yet had the chance to do so, we kindly ask that you go ahead and get that report submitted to the church office as soon as you are able. And of course, you could always reach out to us to see if you have any questions about getting that report submitted. Friends, let us now take a time to prepare our hearts and our minds for the worship of our Lord. As Jesus was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? <clears throat> the man said to Jesus, Teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. Jesus looked at him, loved him, and said, Lack one thing. O oh, sell what you own, and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heart. Then come follow me. When the man heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions.
Please join me in the invocation, followed by the Lord's Prayer. Lord, while change may often be our lot in faithfulness, it is hard. Even you, Prophet Jonah, had difficulty with the change. You called him to a task which challenged his understanding of right or wrong. Yet while Jonah resisted, you kept him on task and worked through him to gather more of your people in faith by your great love, compassion, and grace. Be with us now, O oh God, and give us the strength to remain open-hearted to walk the path you call us to side by side. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Can I have, there they come. Let me sit here. Come a little bit up. Okay, today I brought one of my Christmas presents. Sherilyn made this for me with the help of Shutterfly. Can you take a look? What special occasion this was that about? Exactly, Dee Dee. I was, or I, not me. <laughs> they were getting married, Sherilyn and Josh's wedding album. So, how, how many of you have been to a wedding before? All of you? I know you guys were because you had some pretty cool outfits at a wedding you went to last year. You wore those pants? I know you had hats. That's what I remember from seeing the pictures. And then, Dee Dee and Tiny, you've been to a wedding? What happens at a wedding? It's loud. That can happen. <laughs> There's music, prayers. Oh, that's good. Your cousin family is there. Very good. All right. Well, let's see. There's usually a ceremony, right? Well, there has to be a ceremony. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a wedding. And then it's followed a lot of times by a, a party, a reception. You got it. All right. Well, Today, in Sunday school, you are going to hear about a wedding that Jesus went to, a wedding in Cana. And Jesus went to this wedding, and his friends were there, some of the disciples. His mother was there, so Mary makes an appearance in this story. And during the wedding, they realize, Mary realizes, they may run out of wine. And I can tell you, as the mother of the bride, that would be kind of a freak out moment if you're going to run out of food or wine for people at a party. So not exactly a life or death kind of thing, but, you know, you want to make sure everyone's having fun. So she asked Jesus to do something. Do you know what he does? You're going to find out, all right? But it is his first miracle 
at least in the Bible that we know of. So, um, Ben, oh, Clara's going to pray? All right. Dear God, thank you for everyday miracles and for caring about everything we do. Help us listen to you and do your will. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning I will be reading from Matthew 10, 34 through 39. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And one's foes will be members of one's own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake will find it. This is the gospel message of our Savior. Praise be to you, Lord Jesus Christ.
Friends, let us now take a time to raise those prayers or our innermost hearts to the Lord as we pray in a moment of silence. Loving God, you are all powerful and all knowing. It is by your grace that we may witness truth and love and how best we may serve your people. Hear our prayers, Lord, and bless us all in our need. Lord, we pray for all of your people impacted by the recent severe weather in California. We pray for Kim Swanson as she recovers from a recent surgery in December following a fall. Lord, we pray for Lori, Dave, and Colin Milligan as Lori's mother, Diane Allen, passed away on December 22nd. We pray for the people of Brazil at this time of unrest, that they may know your peace and understanding. Lord, we pray for Gail McKillop as she recovers from a recent back surgery on January 10th. Lord, we know that Gail is in rehab at this time. We also ask that you bless her and her healing and that you give her relief from her pain, Lord. We pray for Vicki and Dave Wanakat as Vicki faces ongoing health challenges at this time, Lord. We pray for Judy Grass as she continues in her cancer treatment. We pray for Bob Smith as he continues battling prostate cancer. Lord, we pray for all impacted by COVID-19 and for all the other viruses and illness that have uh, spread around the world, Lord, and in our country. Uh, we ask that you keep everyone safe and healthy. Lord, we continue to pray for your people of Ukraine and that the war may end there. Lord, we wish a happy birthday and ask your blessings be upon Sam Shinasaki and Cynthia Lyon, Cindy Lyon, and Stephanie Kinnock, as they recently celebrated a birthday, and to Diane Chambers, who celebrates today, and Richard Wilson, who celebrates tomorrow. And on this weekend, just the day before we remember the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and all that he would teach us about you, Lord, and about what we're called to do through you. Well, I'd like to close with some words from a prayer he said to you upon one time. Reverend Dr. King prayed, O oh God, our eternal Father, we praise thee for gifts of mind with which thou hast endowed us. We are able to rise out of the half realities of the sense of the world to a world of ideal beauty and eternal truth. Teach us, we pray thee, how to use this great gift of reason and imagination so that it shall not be a curse, but a blessing. Grant us visions that shall lift us from worldliness and sin 
into the light of thine own holy presence. Through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. the offering for the work of this church will now be received. Let's pray. Loving, giving God, Lord, you bless us to be your people with all that we are, with all that we have, and with all that you have made us able to do. Lord, we ask that you bless these, our gifts, that they may be used to further your love, your peace, which is everlasting. Through Jesus Christ, amen. You may be seated. Friends, I have to confess I gave Margot the harder reading. <laughs> Not on purpose, Margot. <laughs> Jesus shares some hard words in that passage. But we notice that when he does so, he's talking to people that are called to follow him. 
And as part of that hard group of words, he does encourage them to take up their cross. I just want to invite us to keep that part in mind as we move forward with our reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verses 25 through 31. I have said these things to you while I am still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I am going away, and I am coming to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice that I am going to the Father, because the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you this before it occurs, so that when it does occur, you may believe me. I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no power over me. But I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. Rise, let us be on our way. This is the gospel message of our Savior. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, today, today we'll begin a new series that I want to share a couple words about before we, we actually begin it, calling it All In, kind of borrowing that uh, from a couple places. No doubt you've heard that said in many ways in your own lives. Uh, one of them most recently actually came from Josh and Sherilyn's wedding, which was from a previous time before that. Uh, as you may remember, those who were able to be with us at that time, uh, Reverend Art Ritter and I, we co-officiated the wedding. And one of the things that came up as part of that time was uh, a memory of saying, we're all in about doing something. This could be about many things. It could be about the kind of games we play with each other. It could be about things in our daily lives. It could be about our marriage, who we pledge to love for our whole life. It could be about how we're called to follow Jesus, or even how we do that together as a church. Now, I don't remember there being any specific passage that says all in, <laughs> in Jesus' words specifically, but he kind of gets to that all throughout his, his words to his, his own, his, his followers, his people, which includes us today. So we're going with this theme of being all in. And as part of that, we're going to also draw on some of the information that uh, your own long-range planning ministry team has been kind of prayerfully considering for, uh, well, more than half a year now. Uh, so some of the topics we'll talk about each week, we'll draw on study and data and things that are going on in churches around the world, around the country, around our own neighborhood, and then how we, as people, have prayerfully considered that. Much of it will be no surprise to you, and perhaps in, in other parts of your life. So today we're really talking about change, uh, something no doubt Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. talked a whole lot about, and about the need for. But as we can see in his prayer, he also connects us to how God is calling us to this in many ways, in many ways we're called to, 
live out this call to change, sometimes surprising to us. But Jesus talked a lot about this, a lot about this to people who loved him dearly and who were terrified. Can you imagine hearing Margot's reading from your leader? <laughs> some pretty tough words to hear. Well, he said some tough words in John 2. But first, we're going to turn to somebody we might not imagine. The other Judas, not Iscariot. Right before our passage in John, that other Judas says something. Actually, asks Jesus something. He says, but Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Right, so this is the question that the disciple Judas, not Iscariot, asked Jesus right before our passage. So all that we receive from Jesus here, then, is set in the context of the question which immediately came before. This is what John is showing us. Why isn't Jesus known by all people? The other Judas asked. We kind of asked that, too. We might wonder that. After all, we know that it is the risen Jesus himself who charges us to go out and make disciples of all nations, teaching and baptizing them, as he commanded in the Great Commission, which comes to us right at the very end of the Gospel of Matthew. That's the risen Jesus who says this. So just as Jesus was sent by the Father, so are we sent to be witnesses of God's love in the world. But still we have that nagging question. <clears throat> Wouldn't it be easier for God to just show Jesus to all people straight away? Wouldn't that make our job easier? Well, we do well first here to take care about how we approach any big claim like this about the mind of God and what we think we know. While we may want to resolve this tension, and it's reasonable to think so, we also need to remind ourselves that it's not really up to us to know everything. There are the things that are hidden from us, and there are things that God chooses to reveal to us. It's hard, but that's what we have to work with. But what we have been given, what we have been given is really amazing. Beyond our wildest dreams. As a church, in Jesus we have been given the gift of peace. Or what we have understood and the Jewish people have understood for thousands of years in the Hebrew Bible as referring to shalom, a deeper sense of what is understood when we think of peace. Not that which the world might give, as Jesus reminds us, but a true peace, a shalom which only God can, can really offer us. So we think, well, what is that true peace? And how might that look different in Jesus than what the world may try to offer us instead? Any day when we're walking around. Let's see what we can glean when we go back to Jesus' earthly ministry when he was talking to people in the various towns and villages he ministered to, including having his disciples with him. And when we do this, we're reminded that in that time period, this is not a very relaxed time, right? The Roman Empire ruled the majority of the land and had claim to the power and authority which was really largely unprecedented in any understanding of history that we have. The Roman military was more organized than anything which preceded it a big thing to think about. And it was something to be greatly feared in those days when it was actually at that time heightening in strength, getting stronger, not less. 
getting stronger, as opposed to centuries later, when we witness the decline of the empire. That was hundreds of years later. There, at the turn of the millennium, we have an empire which is increasing in power and dominance, and we have many different kinds of people who are subject to it as an occupying force. Certainly this was the case in the Holy Land where we see from the scriptures that the client king, Herod family, and when I say that, family, because if you look back, there's more than one Herod, right? There's several people with the name Herod. They were put in power, kind of as like a puppet regime uh, by Rome. And we remember this, we actually just remembered this, and we thought about the beginning uh, of the epiphany there, right? When Herod learned about the baby Jesus, the true king, being born and the actions that he took to secure his false hold on power. He knew this. But despite this, the Roman Empire did happen to have a saying for its approach to peace, Pax Romana. If you like to read some nerdy books like I do, you'll certainly come across that term. Or it actually just means Roman peace. Now scholars show this as being a period of nearly 200 years or so when there was a supposed peace, that they said, between times of great war within the empire. <laughs> so this is not a time of just peace all throughout the world. This is a time of peace between a huge war and another huge war within just one empire. So maybe peace fell to them, I don't know. So while there may possibly have been less war, any study of early history will reveal that such a peace is uncomplete at best. How can you say that that's a peace? Remember that the New Testament itself, right, if we look at it, was composed actually during this entire time of Pax Romana. And that several ruthless emperors ruled during this so time, well, so, so called time of peace, right? I don't even have to say much about them, and you're not going to think really nice things about them, right? These would be people like Augustus, Caligula, who was considered kind of insane, Nero, who was likely the, the same oppressing ruler. If you want to get nerdy on the book of Revelation, right? Apocalyptic is written during a time of oppression. Scholars think that Revelation was written while Nero persecuted the people so that they would have hope. That's what that's about. Domitian, who made coins showing that he was a god, right? So how peaceful is that, right? For him, maybe. And Marcus Aurelius, who is very, he's kind of a sleeper. When we read about him, sometimes he, uh, he seems like this right, you know, this nice author, you know, scholarly poet, but he actually is one of the biggest persecutors of the church. If you look at what actually happened under his reign, he persecuted the church. Wonderful person to read if you want to look about the classics. Scholar Mary Beard, as in, the, as in a beard, right? Mary Beard retells the story of how Nero actually sat playing his lyre, so kind of like a really old guitar, <laughs> um, while sitting while the city of Rome burns. Isn't that an interesting picture of a leader in peace? And then he actually blamed the disaster on the Christians and tortured them. That was his idea of peace. So, so much for the Roman idea of peace. So we might wonder, and is the absence of overt suffering Right, which is going on during all that time of Pax Romana. And destruction is the absence of that really a form of peace anyway. It's kind of a relief from disaster. Or might there be something deeper to what a true peace looks like? And once we acknowledge that, what, if anything, are we supposed to do in response to it? Are we supposed to do something? I'd suggest there is something. Change. We're called to change in the face of true peace. 
specifically in the face of the true peace that Jesus would come. As his followers, as his church, we may indeed live in the world, certainly we do, and are among all that it gives us. All of its ways as well, right? Good ways and not so good ways. But rather than to endorse everything that goes around us, rather than to uphold any claim to power that is the peace that the world tries to give, well, we're instead really called by Jesus to change. All throughout the Gospels, Jesus calls on his disciples to change, right? We just heard it in this really difficult reading, right, from Matthew, to take up our cross, to bear the burdens of one another, right? We see Paul writes to the Galatians about that and tells them that they're actually fulfilling the law of Christ by doing that. That's how they do it, is by bearing the burden. But to love one another, one another sacrificially, right? To lay down one's life for another. As we see that just after the, uh, Jesus gives the, the love commandment. And one of the other really difficult ones that we ever could get to in a Bible study. To love your enemy. How can you not change and love your enemy? But it's far easier, <laughs> this is saying nothing new at all, it's far easier to stay the same, isn't it? For any of us, in any time period, really. It's difficult to change. It's hard. Which helps explain, certainly, the resistance that any one of us would have to change. But not all of us. Fear is near the center of any people's resistance to change. We fear losing what we have what we know, losing what we love. We fear of the new and the unknown. And the new and the unknown could be anything, right? It could be people, new cultures or different customs. It could be music. It could be technology. Or even the way things were which very curiously are different from some, for some people than they are for others. And as is silly even to highlight, resistance to change is nothing new, right? We've all lived through this throughout our lives. There were times uh, centuries ago, um, you may have heard this before, when people in the church didn't want to stop singing the Psalms. Can you imagine that? I'm sure Danny and Dave, maybe I read it in some nice old book we had. <laughs> because the idea of hymns was too new. They didn't want to sing the newfangled hymns. They wanted to stay with the Psalms. And now people have been singing hymns for hundreds of years. Isn't that interesting? Not even our Catholic or Orthodox Church brothers and sisters have their worship liturgies exactly the same as the early church, right? And for any who have experienced, um, if you were able to see this a little bit online, um, the recent big funeral of Pope Benedict, well, maybe you look at different things than I do, but as a pastor, I look at all kinds of things going around, and when you do, you see that there are screens outside the Vatican, right? And you see all this, you see all this, you know, these words and different things on the screens, and you realize that there's actually electronic worship screens right in, in, in Vatican City. That's kind of interesting. I even had a friend in seminary a couple of years ago. Uh, he actually grew up, I have to emphasize this, he grew up only experiencing contemporary worship. Okay, so I'll explain that. So when, when in seminary we did a few classic hymns or did hymns in a new way, he actually felt very disconnected because he thought that they were all old. <laughs> because he only did new music. 
And to him, things in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s is old. Isn't that interesting? So it seems like in some ways we can get used to many different kinds of things, and those become normal to us. But now i got a question for, for you. Have you ever really been afraid of something? Something specific. Maybe even think as being a kid or something. And you were really, just really afraid of it. Maybe it was a spooky closet in your childhood bedroom. Or maybe you were a little thrown by the behavior of a colleague who always kind of really just blew off the handles when deadlines loomed and you weren't sure what was going to happen. Or maybe fear struck when needs became more urgent at home as when the last can of soup was opened by you, not knowing when or where the next meal would come. Of course, we know that our fear as People is, is, is an irrational thing. It grows from the fact that we do not fully understand something or we don't have all the information about something from our ignorance. But when truth or information that is truth, right, shines in, then that changes things for us. Right, that murky closet is changed when mom turns the light on. And you see that that's just your coat thrown on top of a big teddy bear. That's all that is. Or we see that there's definitely no monster in there because we know what that is, right? And we sigh with relief. Or when we learn that our, our very stressed colleague has only recently suffered the loss of her spouse and, and that over years, actually, she's been battling other challenges. She's been battling other things for more than 10 years. Well, then maybe we begin to approach the behavior we receive in a different way. Or, again, personally, when we learn of the blessing of a new local food pantry and all the ways it can bless us specifically, our family, well, we, of course, realize that life still has challenges which this doesn't fix. Boy, are we really relieved to know that this resource does exist. Learning that love is present reminds us that we don't need to fear as much. It also shows us that it's okay for us to change. In our passage from John today, Jesus tells his disciples, they're kind of worried and not sure what's going to happen, right? He's about to go, and he's, <laughs> he's trying to give them some good information before he does. And he, he tells them not to let their hearts be troubled or afraid. For he does not give as the world gives. Rather, the peace we receive in Jesus is knowing that God loves us and has all things under control. By acknowledging the lordship of Jesus, we have the knowledge that was missing before. We don't need to be afraid about what will happen to us. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, Jesus tells us. And friends, this is no worldly peace. This is not a passing phase of contentment or a period of slightly less war, or a false peace, as in the Pax Romana. No, in Jesus, we have a peace unlike any the world can really offer us. You see, the peace which Jesus extends to us is rooted in the complete trust and love of God, who cares for us and 
rules compassionately over all things and over all time. Any of our past glories will not give us true peace. Nor will false promises made that we cannot keep. Rather, it is by our faith in Jesus that we are blessed with the true and lasting peace that John writes of. And knowing this, Jesus reminds us that we need to have no fear. Regardless of what challenges the world can throw our way and hurt us as it may, and it will. Such concern is, is next to nothing to the peace that we may have in Jesus. For in Jesus we have great hope that all suffering, all pain, and all tears come to an end. And that on God's timing, all will be renewed. All will be renewed according to God's wonderful and gracious plan that we will be restored and renewed in the coming kingdom. But how do we know this? How do we know this? Well, Jesus tells us this himself repeatedly. And so do the other works of the New Testament. But here in John, Jesus tells us that the Holy Spirit will be our teacher and guide, our advocate. The Holy Spirit will be in the hearts of God's faithful, teaching them not just a couple of things, but everything. And when we feel adrift, well, the Spirit may open our hearts and our minds and then remind us to what Jesus has told us that we don't need to be afraid, that it's okay, even good, to change. Friends, in Jesus, we have been given a fearless peace which transcends the influence of the world all around us. And it really bursts forth from the spirit-filled hearts of those in the church throughout time, including us now. So when we witness others in need, be it in need of encouragement or in need of something, a physical help or emotional or even spiritually, something spiritually that they need help with, may we remember these words of Jesus that we may share that sense of Jesus' for those in need. For in this way, Jesus does make himself known to all people by our love. We are known to be his people. So may we place our trust in the Lord that the work of our hands point through all fear to the hope all God's people have in Jesus. May be so. Amen. Well, friends, please rise in body or spirit and join in singing our ascending hymn 501. In Christ, there is no east or west.
He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness, and the light dwells with him. Friends, may, may God bless us in the changes we are called to make, all for God's, God's glory. And now, friends, may the God of everlasting peace bless you to be a beacon of Jesus' love to all people. Go to serve. Go with God. Amen.